Welcome everybody to the Circle of Insight. I'm Dr. Carlos. Today we're going to be taking a look at what does Islam say about heaven and hell? Well, we know what a lot of different religions say. Uh, well, maybe you don't. I don't know. Uh, we're going to find out what they say about it with Shabir Ali. Imam Shabir Ali. He's the president of the Islamic Information and Dawah Center International in Toronto, and he's going to give us some insight of what Islam says about heaven and hell. So let's not waste any more time. Let's welcome to the show Imam Ali. Welcome, sir. Thanks for having me on, Dr. Carlos. So uh, this is a fascinating question. Heaven and hell in Islam. First of all, are there variations of the belief of heaven and hell? Well, well, definitely on some minor details, but uh, the general outlines, I think, are very uh, broadly held among Muslims, uh, and between Sunnis and Shi'is and uh, even other denominations. Uh, basically, we, we die, but somehow um, our identity survives. Uh, we, our bodies are reunited, uh, probably by being recreated, reunited with that identity, and we face God for judgment. Uh, God separates uh, the sheep from the goats, so uh, the, those who are on the good side go to paradise, those who are uh, on the evil side, they go to hell. Um, I, I want to add to this mix that uh, it is mentioned in the Quran that there is a place called Al-Araf, the heights. The seventh chapter of the Quran is named after that. This is seldom discussed among Muslims, uh, largely because we don't know who goes there. Uh, and uh, also because people tend to think in black and white terms, it's either heaven or hell. But this is a third place, the heights, and uh, it seems to be an intermediary place between heaven and hell. And what's it called again? The heights. Uh, the heights, and, and that's in Arabic as well? Uh, in, in Arabic, Al-Araf. Al-Araf, okay. That's in chapter that's 7 right. of the Quran, interesting. So it almost sounds like a that's purgatory right. similar to a Catholic Catholicism. It, it may be related, uh, so one of the ideas about who goes there um, is that it may be a temporary place for some persons who have done well enough uh, to go to paradise on the one hand, but they have done something that holds them back from entering paradise. So this is a kind of a holding facility. And in any case, from the Quran's description of this, it's clear that, that the people who are there in, in the heights uh, do have an expectation that they will eventually enter paradise. Interesting. And let me ask you, um, we're going to get more into the weeds when it comes to heaven in a little bit. Uh, try to bring some clarity of the doctrine of heaven. Uh, is heaven and hell mentioned in the Quran as well, or is it primarily in the Hadiths? It's mentioned. Both, both are mentioned in the Quran as well, heaven and hell, uh, throughout. Um, so th this seems to be like the underlying... Um, motif behind uh, the, the Quran's morality. You do good, you go to heaven. You do bad, you, you go to hell. And it's repeated constantly. Okay, so it's all over the, it's all over the Quran. And do the Hadiths, what are, they, right. are the Hadiths describing more what it looks like? Or do they mention it in a similar fashion as yes. the Quran? Yeah, generally the Hadiths um, uh, take uh, the, the bare Quranic narratives about things and go into greater detail. So stories of the prophets will be fleshed out in the Hadith, often by uh, incorporating stories from the Bible and from uh, other um, oral sources known to Jews and Christians. Um, in terms of the prayers, they'll be briefly mentioned in the Quran, but uh, amply described in every detail in the Hadith, and so on. So, so too with heaven and hell, uh, the Hadith go into greater detail describing the comforts of paradise, uh, and on the other hand, uh, the tortures of hell. Interesting. Interesting stuff. Uh, in regards, I, we have to get some of the myths out of the way, or if there are myths, I don't know. Uh, just questions for you. Um, people have mentioned before, especially the, the jihadis are the ones who always bring it up, so I, I just want to make sure about that. But the 72 virgins, is that something that's in a hadith? Is that actually something that's true? What's your take on that? It's mentioned in, in hadiths, uh, not in the most authentic hadiths that I'm aware of, uh, and it's not mentioned in the Quran. In the Quran, it is clear that uh, 
men in this life are, are permitted to marry more than one wife and the context and when that should be applied and its uh, rationale and so on. These are all details that probably we don't have time on this show to get into. Uh, but the, the similar um, idea seems to prevail in that uh, when men go to heaven, they, they, they will not be limited to one wife. Uh, it, uh, but, but the number of wives is not specified. It's not mentioned in the Quran that uh, martyrs or anyone else will get 72 virgins to, as wives in paradise. Okay. I had to bring that up because everybody always asks me that question. Um, are rewards in heaven uh, different for the genders? If mo most of what is mentioned uh, seems to be all inclusive, that uh, both men and women uh, will, uh, both of them have souls to begin with, and uh, they will equally be rewarded for their good deeds in this life, and on the contrary, uh, obviously uh, punished uh, for their evils, unless God chooses to forgive us, and for, for it is his grace that we look forward to. But as for the particular ple pleasures in paradise, the, uh, the, the, the men's uh, sexual relations in paradise are, are often mentioned, and uh, the question is, who will they have these sexual relations with? And uh, the answer is often that there are special women created for men in paradise in addition to the wives that they had in this life. Though that, of course, has some complications to discuss. Which wife, if you've had several wives and if a woman has had uh, various husbands, uh, who will have her in the life hereafter? This was a question that was put to Jesus with reference to leverage marriages on the Gospels. A woman has had seven husbands in succession. Uh, who will be her husband in, in paradise? So a similar question can be discussed in, in the Islamic context as well. Uh, but uh, back to your question, uh, while it is often emphasized that men will have female counterparts, the question uh, in, in converse is, what, what about women? Will they also have uh, multiple partners? And um, uh, th there is no answer from this clearly in the, in the Islamic tradition. Uh, but uh, some scholars have speculated that uh, since there is a basic equality between men and women under the eyes of God, uh, the promises uh, of reward are, are equal for both, and uh, we should just put it under a blanket term by saying that the Quranic wording um, indicating that we will have in paradise whatever we desire, uh, that is what... Um, is the overriding factor here. So it depends on what people will desire when they get there. It's not necessarily what we desire when we are here. You know, if you ask a kid, what, what do you want? Maybe the kid wants the entire Toys R Us store. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, when the kid grows up, the kid may actually desire different things because you take pleasure in so many different things. Even uh, a simple act of gardening can, can be a pleasurable experience. So... When we are here, we might imagine all kinds of goodies that we would like in heaven, but when we get to heaven and the new reality opens before us, uh, what we desire at that time may be entirely out of this world. But that is what we are promised we will have. All right. I'll tell you, uh, Imam Shabir Ali knows his stuff. He's the one right person to ask. Um, Imam. Oh, thanks for saying that, Carlos. <laughs> of course. Let me ask you this, Imam. Um, I got a couple more questions. Uh, criteria. Should I ask criteria first, or should we go to hell? Uh, let's go to criteria first to heaven, and then we'll we'll talk about hell. Um, what's is there a criteria to go to heaven? There are things every religion usually has. We have to you know do, uh, you have to be a disciple of Christ and do everything Christ wanted. Uh, what are some of the criteria for for Islam in regards to going to heaven? What is mentioned uh, pervasively in the Quran are two things: uh, belief and and practice. Uh, so. Uh, those who believe and do righteous deeds, uh, that, that, that is mentioned as the basic uh, two criteria for a person entering into paradise. Sometimes just the belief alone is mentioned. Um, um, like, for example, in one passage it says, whoever says that there is only one God and, um, and remains steadfast on that, um, such a person shall neither fear nor grieve, but the angels will descend on such a person saying, uh, you, we are your friends in this world and the life hereafter and so on. Got it. Interesting. Um, so it isn't really, I know uh, there are certain, certain Christian groups that believe a lot of it has to do with acts alone. Uh, are there any kind of Islamic sects that have that kind of differentiation as well? <laughs> and, and saying that actions
Christians alone will will guarantee one's entry into paradise. Yeah, or to be a major contributor to it. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely in Islamic thought, actions uh, are a major contributor, but um, the the belief is uh, emphasized more. As in the one case I mentioned, uh, just the belief is mentioned rather than the uh, than the practice. And and the difference uh, may be, as explained by some Muslim scholars, that uh, a person may have the belief in Internally, a person is internally and mentally committed to God, but for some reason or another, that, uh, that, that belief in the mind has not manifested itself in practice. I mean, normally they go hand, to get, hand in hand together if you uh, believe that there is a 300-pound Bengal tiger in front of your door, <laughs> probably you're not going to go out uh, in the next couple of minutes. Um, and so, so what you believe affects your actions, but uh, not always so. Somebody may, for example, internally have uh, committed himself or herself to the idea that there is only one God, which is the central tenet of Islam. But that person, for some reason or another, may not have acted on that belief. There are some people who report to me that because of their uh, of the religious background of their families, they're not really mentally free to practice the religion of Islam in the presence of their families. So they've got to keep it uh, secret. And of course, it happens in other contexts as well. Maybe there are uh, some Christians who, due to persecution in Muslim lands, uh, would, would not uh, dare to express their Christianity and so on. Um, uh, but, but in the case of the Muslim in this, in this uh, sense, that being the one who has already internalized the belief, we would consider that person already a Muslim, and uh, we would think that the promises uh, that go uh, for belief uh, would, uh, would apply to this person as well, even though this person has not had the opportunity to act on, on that belief. Excellent. Uh, a couple of questions to go here. I know we're running out of time. We've got about five or six minutes. Um, hell. Uh, there are different versions of hell in all the different religions. Uh, it could be eternal damnation, burning, uh, it could be just non-existent. You never existed anymore. Um, what's the Islamic version? Hmm. Generally, um, in, in the Quran, hell is depicted um, almost like a physical place with uh, physical fire and, and so on. However, in, in modern times, when it comes to both paradise and hell, uh, Many Muslim uh, scholars think that uh, these descriptions should not be taken uh, in their physical uh, natures as, uh, as, as the graphic pictures are painted in the Quran. These are pictures only to give us some idea. And the fact uh, that, that this is only to give us some idea is drawn from uh, a passage in the Quran in the second chapter where it says that when we eat fruits in paradise, um, that uh, it will not be like the fruits of this life. It's only mentioned like this as a kind of similitude. Uh, so it's something like this, or something is mentioned to describe that experience using terms that we're familiar with to give us some idea, but the reality is much different than, than the idea that, that we formulate in our minds. Uh, so, so this is even more necessary to think about when we um, think about the, the tortures of hell, because uh, to take them all in their literal sense would uh, make God appear very cruel. And in the Islamic tradition, the mercy of God is stressed. This is stressed especially in the Quran, where God is refer referred to by two names right at the beginning, uh, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, uh, the, the beneficent, the merciful one. Uh, and this is mentioned throughout the, the Quran. Uh, so that's, that's one reason we, uh, a good reason we have for thinking that the tortures of hell are not um, to be taken so literally. And um, I want to add to this, Dr. Carlos, in yes. case we run out of time, that uh, there, although there is a widespread Muslim belief that hell is eternal, uh, there has been a significant minority of Muslim scholars who have held that uh, hell will not actually be eternal. Um, huh. Now, how, what will be the result? Uh, this uh, has been explained variously, but, uh, but, but this is a well-grounded position that has been argued by a significant minority of scholars. That's interesting. Yeah, I haven't heard that one. That's interesting. Um, have you ever seen No Exit from Jean-Paul Sartre? No, I haven't. Oh, okay. He depicts hell as having three people that he's talking to that he hates the conversations with for eternity. 
and it always reminds me of which is the worst <laughs> hell. <laughs> um, and a little side note. Uh, anyway, as I was, t- let me ask you a quick question in regards to heaven, entry into heaven. You've heard of Pascal's wager? Yes. What do you think about? I mean, is that that's something that I mean, you know they used to throw out a lot in the Christian religion? Is that something that's ever uh, ever taught in Islam? Uh, the Pascal's wager concept as well. It's better to believe in Allah than not at all. <laughs> yeah, as you know, I involve myself in in discussions with uh, with persons of other faiths, and, and sometimes uh, sure. with with atheists as well. And so uh, this comes up. But generally, in Islamic discourse, uh, a lot of the discussion is about what we believe, rather than uh, like how do we um, confute an atheist, uh, as an example. Uh, but Pascal's wager is um, is interesting in this context, and in, in talking with our atheist friends, we should not put it in such a way uh, to uh, let the atheist infer that we uh, believe just because we fear uh, something in the afterlife. Uh, rather, we have very good reasons for believing, but where Pascal's wager comes in is if somebody is at that borderline and, and, and doesn't know where do I place my commitment, um, it, it, Pascal's wager basically says, well, if you believe, you, you, your gain is infinite and, and you lose nothing. But uh, if you choose not to believe, the possibility of, uh, in case you happen to be wrong, uh, the possibility of, uh, of, of that infinite pleasure is lost forever. And you really, you don't gain anything by, by not believing. You may uh, enjoy a, a, a finite life according to your dictates, but that doesn't always lead to good pleasure. Somebody may think, okay, let me pursue money even by illicit means, uh, but the money may not eventually buy you happiness. Whereas on the other hand, uh, pursuing religion may actually bring you happiness, even if it turns out that the religion was not true in, in the end. Um, but uh, Pascal's wager puts these two possibilities in perspective and, and shows that logically it makes a greater sense to commit yourself to belief, in which case, in fact, the experience of many believers is that the belief eventually comes to you through that initial commitment. Interesting. Good answer. Interesting. Um, I'll just ask you one more, uh, two more questions. One's really brief. Um, the apocalypse, does it play a big role in Islam? Um, uh, for some people, yes. Uh, those who have a habit of uh, going to uh, back to the classical books and reading those, they will have a, a, a keen interest in, in the apocalypse, and uh, they will be, be searching for passages that uh, denote the apocalypse. Uh, most Muslims uh, go about uh, their lives not thinking so much about how things will end, but but thinking about uh, what we need to do here and now in, in this life, making this world a better place, fulfilling our responsibilities as stewards of the earth and of all creation, and uh, just being uh, good people, uh, good citizens of our lands uh, and kind persons to uh, the rest of God's creatures. Um, so we have this sort of dichotomy in, 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 in terms of actual practice. But uh, the apocalypse of, uh, obviously is there uh, in the classical sources, and those who want to uh, find them uh, do have that material to go look for. And my last question is, we know a lot of the, the jihadi groups are really distorting Islam, and the sayings, and they've cherry-picked uh, the Quran and Hadith, however they want to do it. Um, what do you want to tell people What's one of the most important things you want to share to people about what Islam really is? Well, Islam is about peace and it's about harmony with God to begin with and uh, by extension to all of God's uh, creatures. Uh, when uh, some Muslims uh, uh, commit acts of violence against uh, civilians in particular, people more generally, thinking that they are um, serving the Islamic faith, uh, often what we're seeing is a distortion of the Islamic faith. Uh, it, Islam is not about killing people, but about saving them. Uh, the Quran uh, depicts God as uh, a merciful God, um, and uh, in the Quran as well, the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, is uh, said to be sent as a mercy to people in the 21st chapter of the Quran in the 107th verse. 
And uh, with this in mind, if Muslims are true followers of the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace, then we should be merciful to other people as well. And killing them certainly is not an act of uh, mercy. It is the opposite. Absolutely. Imam Shabir Ali. Imam, where do we get more information about you and what you're up to? Oh, you can check out my uh, website, uh, Quranspeaks.com. That is the site that has past episodes of our television broadcast called Let the Quran Speak. Uh, you can also go to Islaminfo.com, where I have some articles, uh, and uh, ShabirAli.com. Wow, it's a lot, a lot of websites. And we'll recommend everybody's book, Common Questions People Ask About Islam, Shabir Ali. We thank you so much, Iwan, for being here. We truly appreciate it. Thank you for having me on the show, Dr. Carlos. We thank you, everyone, for listening in. I hope you enjoyed the show as much as I did. Remember, you can catch more of our episodes at BehavioralAnalysisGroup.com, BehavioralAnalysisGroup.com. Once again, Imam Shabir Ali. You can find him at ShabirAli.com and the host of the, the other two websites, which I can't remember off the top of my head, but you can listen back to the show to get them. Thanks again, everyone.